That is that uh, there were a number of pastors because of the war who did flee, but uh, the churches are actually uh, overflowing with brand new believers because of the war as well, and so the next guy has stepped up. And so it might just be a layman who's been in the church, and so he's taken over. And so we're going to help these men by giving them libraries. And so that's part of what we're going to be doing. And so I'm thankful that uh, my commentary is one of the books that will be given away. And so we'll do a pastor's conference. Uh, you remember Yvonne from last year who was here? Yvonne will be speaking as well. And so I'm looking forward to seeing some of my friends uh, from Kremenchuk. So we'll do that. And then on that, uh, so then next Sunday, uh, I'll be preaching at a church uh, in the city of Kemelnitsky. And then from there, we're going to travel to the neighboring country of Moldova. I've never been to Moldova before. The capital city is Chisinau. And there is a Bible college that we participate in. It's called the University of Divine Grace Seminary. Pretty fancy name. And so uh, it'll be our first time there. And we're going to connect with them and just find out what are some next steps that we can do with them to help their seminary. And then uh, from there, Steve and Velody will be flying on to Kyrgyzstan. We have been working with a project with them. The, uh, the, some of the former countries of the Soviet Union that broke away, uh, there's a nice gospel presence there. And so uh, we've been working with some seminaries in Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan. And they made a request, the greatest need for Russian-speaking churches is that just good theological resources. We have a... Uh, a rich heritage. There's probably more theological resources in the pastor's office, and you have no pastor, than most Ukrainian pastors have who are ser serving full time. And so, what they've asked us to do, they've identified. Uh, uh, there was a uh, Charles Ryrie, if you're familiar with the Charles Ryrie Study Bible. Charles Ryrie was a, a professor for many years at Dallas Seminary. He wrote a good systematic theology called Basic Theology. He has since passed away, but his family. Uh, formed a foundation, and so uh, that book was identified by the uh, churches in Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan. They would like to have that translated, not into Russian, but into their original language, which is Kazakh and Kyrgyz. And so we were able to secure the rights to that. When they knew it was going to go into missions, they gave us a very cheap price of only $1,000. And so we've had teams in those two countries translating the book into their languages and the uh, Kyrgyz translation is now done. And so Steve and Volodya will travel on to Kyrgyzstan and celebrate the completion and the printing of that book. I will be traveling home because I have a wedding to do next weekend and hopefully I will be awake for that wedding. I will uh, land on Wednesday and then... Um, I am supposed to go to the orchestra Thursday morning. My wife says, you're not going to stay awake for that, but I'm going to try. I think I'll sneak a Pepsi in, into the concert hall. And then I already scheduled, I have a funeral visitation Thursday night. I have a funeral on Friday, and then we have the wedding practice Friday night. So I think I'll be good for the weekend. And so that's my plan anyway. So when I do come home, I'll be nice and busy. But anyway, you can pray for me. For those of you who are friends on Facebook, I'll try to post every day on Facebook as far as the trip and keep you up to date on that. But I'd appreciate uh, your prayers for me while I'm traveling. Okay. When I was a, uh, between my junior and senior year of college, I spent the summer in the country of Peru down in South America. My Bible College had a program for those who are interested in missions called the Missionary Apprenticeship Program, or the MAP program. And uh, they contacted different missionaries around the world, and per uh, Peru uh, had a really good MAP program. They had kids going from Bible colleges for many years, and so because Spanish was my primary language when I was in college, I thought it'd be good to go down there and get a taste for that. So eight of us American kids from different Bible colleges, we flew down to Peru, and we're going to spend the summer, and what they did, they had us living with different missionary families, and then we formed an evangelistic team. We would travel around the country. We spent the first four weeks just in the capital city of Lima and all the churches that these missionaries were starting there. And so what we would do, we'd go to a community, and during the day, we would hand out tracts to invite them to the service. The gringos were the attraction. People wanted to see Americans. And so uh, we had formed that, and some of us knew pretty good Spanish, and some of us could talk. Uh, we were all musical, and so we would do music, we'd give testimonies, things like that. And then we traveled with a Peruvian evangelist by the name of Pancho Acho. Yeah, he was a very unique guy. And so uh, we would share the gospel. 
as we spent time with the missionaries, they were very good at evangelism and starting churches, but because that was their focus, they also recognized that they were not doing a good job of training now the next generation of native Peruvians to be the pastors and church leaders. And so they're fo so focused on evangelism, they had not set up uh, colleges or seminaries, and so they realized there was a great lack. When they began to identify a young Peruvian person that they thought could go into pastoral leadership, some of them made the choice to send them to a Bible college in America. But they soon learned that that was not a good focus because many times those kids now seeing the better life of America never came back. And so what happened is that when they left their poor country and they came to America and they saw our wealth, many times that wealth caused them to say, why would I go back to a poor country? And so they realized that that was not a good strategy and so they began to form Bible colleges instead. And that is kind of the mindset of what I want to talk about this morning and it's reflected in some of the music as well. And that is you and I as Christians, we need to have an orientation not to this world, but the world that is coming. You may recall from last Sunday that we looked at this passage here where Paul was telling them, he had said earlier, I want you to follow my example. This is what a Christian ought to be. And you can even follow the example of Timothy and Epaphroditus. You, want, you need to follow my example. Why? Because I think if in the churches, there were some bad examples. And so Paul had said, he said, warning them of certain people of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, they walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. And notice that fourfold description that we examined last Sunday. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. They glory in their shame. And then the last phrase we're going to key off of with minds set on earthly things. They could even be Christians. Paul was saying, as a Christian, do not emulate a Christian who is so into this world they don't really realize that they're actually heading to a world to come. So that is what I want you to think about today as we turn our text. These are the last two verses of chapter 3. So Paul says, why? Why should you avoid those people? Even if they're Christians, why should you avoid an earthly Christian? He says, because our citizenship is in heaven. And from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. And so, in sharp contrast to the warning last week, Paul says there are certain, even if they're Christians, they're earthly-minded, they are so involved in this world, they don't realize they're actually heading toward another world. And so Paul says, as a child of God, your concentration you need to concentrate all of your energies and attentions on the future, not in the present. Well, how do you do that? Because we have to live here, right? There is an involvement. But Paul says, as you go through every single day, you need to remind yourselves, this is not the world to which I'm going to belong. This world is not my eternity. The believer needs to realize that they do not belong to this world. Therefore, this world's standards and interests should not become your standards and interests. And again, the world is constantly trying to shape. They want us to fit in. They want us to have the same values that they do. And when you don't do it, they begin to press on you to have that. And so in light of this knowledge, what Paul will say, that the believer, rather than investing in this world, you need to start investing in the world to come. And what I want to do, I want to take a little bit of time you see that word that's translated citizenship? If you will humor me for a while, I'd like to give you a little Greek lesson, okay? Could you tolerate a little Greek today? Okay, thank you. Maury says it's okay, so whatever Maury says goes. We have actually seen this word earlier in the book. So let me take it. This word comes from a very interesting word family. Let me take you through it. The first word we saw was the word polis. And you know that word because you've all been to Minneapolis, haven't you? or to Indianapolis, okay? And so in Acts chapter 16, referring to the city of Philippi, it says, Luke says, and from there they went to Philippi, which is a leading city, polis, of the district of Macedonia in a Roman colony. Remained in this city some days. So when Paul 
uses a word that came from that. They knew what he was getting at. And so one, as a Christian, you belong to a different city. Okay? Now you may not remember, but earlier in the book, we looked at this passage out of chapter, 20, uh, chapter 1, where Paul says, Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. So, well, I don't see any word that refers to the talk, the city. That phrase that's translated, your manner of life, it is actually the Greek word polituomai. And so it bases on the word poly. And so what Paul, he's kind of coining a phrase. They got it, and we have to explain it. What Paul is saying, the word that's translated, let your manner of life, saying, be a good citizen. Not of your polis, not of Philippi, be a good citizen of where you're headed to, okay? As a Christian, you are not a citizen of this country. You should be a citizen of another country. My brother has a T-shirt that he's had printed, and on the T-shirt, it says, I, plead, I pledge allegiance to the king, not country, okay? And what he's getting at is that even among evangelicals, there are many evangelicals who wrap themselves in the flag and think that's Christianity. It's not. Okay? I, we live in a country that is very antagonistic to our faith. I'm thankful I live in America, but I don't love America. Okay? I live in a pagan country where missionaries should be sent to our country. And so as a Christian... I don't pledge allegiance to my country. I pledge allegiance to the king. And that was what Paul was trying to remind them as well. You live in Philippi. You're a Roman citizen. But your citizenship is somewhere else. And so when Paul says, let your manner of life is in, you need to live as a worthy citizen, not of Rome. Don't be a good Roman. Be a good Christian. And so now we come to the third word, which is our word today, and that is Paul Tulemi. Well, Paul says our citizenship, and his audience knew what he was getting at. The people in Philippi took great pride that they were Roman citizens because it gave them lots of rights, lots of freedoms. But Paul reminds them, you are not a citizen of Philippi. You are not a citizen of Rome. You are a Christian. And so your allegiance lies somewhere else. And so that's what I want to peruse today as we work through this as well. Paul's reminding them. So think about this. When the city of Philippi was set up, the Caesar of that time was trying to start another outpost in the Roman Empire. And so what he would do, he would cashier veterans out of the army. And he would send them to Philippi and said, okay, now create an outpost. And so what did they do? When they came to that, what did they do? They brought their Roman culture. They brought their language. They brought all that stuff. Why? Because he's trying to expand his empire. That's what God is trying to do with us. Why does God place people in different parts of the world? Because he's trying to expand his empire. And so as a Christian, if I go to another country, I'm not going to bring American values to that country. That may be the worst thing to do. In fact, that's probably the biggest thing that's happened in evangelism. Most of the world thinks that the American evangelical church is doing it right. We have a lot of bad stuff in American evangelical churches. And so what we do is that we transport that bad stuff to the world. There are churches in Ukraine that are just little eel brooks. That's all they are just little eagle bricks. They mimic everything because they think, well, that's what they're doing. One of the worst things that we've exported, not we, but the evangelical church, is the uh, prosperity gospel. They have bought that garbage all over the world. Why? Because it came from America. And so, as a missionary, you don't bring American culture and put it into a church. You bring God's culture. And so think about this. Just as Caesar would take veterans and put them in another part because he wanted to expand his empire, that's what God is trying to do with you. The reason why God has placed you in this part of the world, he's trying to expand his kingdom using you. And therefore, what he wants you and I to act like Christians. He wants us to impact our world. 
that's what Paul is getting at. So to me, that is a great picture of what a Christian ought to be. I remember when I resigned my first church, I felt that my ministry was coming to an end in Wasika, but I didn't have another church lined up. I didn't know about Rush City Baptist yet. And so I just, I quit, my, I quit the church and I just went and got a job. And so I got a job at a factory called Wasika Food and Storage. And so uh, I didn't know how long it was take to find another church, but I was just ready to get to work and all that. And so I began to work at a factory, so I kind of became a grunt. I wore dirty clothes, and, and I drove a forklift, and I did physical labor. But when I walked into that factory, I knew I was first and foremost a Christian. I had been trying to encourage the people of my church to share their faith, and it just didn't happen as much as I wanted, which is one of the reasons why I left there. So I just said, okay, now I get to put it into practice. They don't know who I am. I deliberately did not tell them I was a pastor. Because when they find out you're a pastor, no one's honest with you anymore. They all watch their language and things like that as well. So my job was, I went in, and every night as I drove to the factory, I said, God, give me someone to talk to about you tonight. The first thing I needed to do, I needed to show them I had a good work ethic. I was one of the older guys. I was you know, older by then. And a lot of young guys were working there. And so my job was, I just wanted to outwork them. I wanted to work. I wanted to do my part and all that. The first night we got done, because we work with food product, you have to completely clean the factory because then the next shift comes in, they're doing food product. But I noticed that every guy, and there were different departments, every guy just cleaned his area and then just went to the break room and sat there. But we couldn't leave until the whole factory was cleaned. Well, I thought, well, this is foolish. And so I cleaned my area, and then I went to the next area. I grabbed a broom, and I started cleaning it. And the guy in there is, what are you doing? Uh, I thought I'd help you. I didn't ask you to. I know, but I can't go home until you're done. So wouldn't it make sense that I might help you? Well, I'm not going to help you. I didn't ask you to. <laughs> and so I just started, and they couldn't figure it out. Why would you help me? Because I want to go home. I noticed then, because of that, then the other guys started doing that as well. They didn't go to the break room anymore. And then I began to find, and so lots of times on a night, there'd be a couple of us in a particular room, and so then I'd start a conversation, and I always wanted them to know that I wanted to have a serious conversation. In the break room, guys will not have a serious, you know, they got to talk about how much they drank and sports and sex and all that, but if you get a guy one-on-one -on -one and you let them know you want to have a serious conversation, they often would get serious with me. I started asking them, you know, what are your plans for your life? Uh, working at a factory, but what are your bigger plans? And so anyway, through that nine months I was there, by the time I got done, I had talked to every one of the guys about the Lord. Why? Because I wasn't a factory worker. I was an evangelist. I had a responsibility to all those guys to find out where they were going. And so that is what Paul is trying to get at here. And so what's interesting, so when Paul uses that metaphor, but our citizenship is in heaven, they knew what he was getting at. Because when the city of Philippi was set up, they took great pride and they were a Roman colony. Take a look at this next verse. This comes out of the book of Acts. This is when Paul came to the city of Philippi. And remember, he led Lydia to the Lord and then the church formed in her house. And you remember then he, he was going on and there was this uh, demon-possessed girl who, because of that, could tell people's futures. And then uh, she began to harass Paul, and so uh, Paul cast the demon out of her. And all of a sudden, she lost her ability to make money for her owners. And then here's what the owners did. They got mad because their pocketbook of affection says, when they brought them to the magistrates in Philippi, they said, these men are Jews, and they are disturbing our city. We're a Roman city, city here. They're Jews. Look, it says, they advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. All of a sudden, it mattered to them that they were Roman citizens. Well, Paul is now leading a lot of these people to the Lord. He reminds them, you are not a Roman citizen anymore. You are a citizen of a bigger city that's coming, and you need to act that way. So here's what I'd like to do for the rest of our time together. I'd like to talk about how can I, as a Christian, live this out? Again, we've got to live here. We all got to go to work tomorrow. I'll be picking apples for eight hours or for four hours tomorrow morning. We all got to work. We got to pay our bills. 
Our kids go to school. We make all those decisions. But how do I have the mentality that I do not belong to this world? And how do I reflect that when I'm around people who are invested in this world and they want me to be just like them? How do I live differently? I'm going to give you some illustrations of what I did with my children to remind them where they belong. You can take or leave my illustrations. But I want to talk through, and I have it in the outline as well. And so these are some things. To me, this is a portrait of a Christian who lives in this world as a resident alien, knowing that I do not belong to this world. So number one, Paul says, or here's what I say. I'm going to put it in the first person to make it personal. While I presently live in this country, I have many more ties to my homeland. So I just want to focus. Look at, this is our attachment. This is a passage out of 1 Peter, where Peter says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, look at that phrase, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, and the key phrase is kept in heaven for you. You realize the day when you accepted Christ as your Savior, you were given an inheritance, but you haven't got it all yet. Okay? Now, God has given us lots of blessings. He's given us the Holy Spirit. God has blessed us in a lot of material things but the greatest part of our inheritance is still coming and where is it it's kept in heaven for you one of the doctrines i really love is the doctrine of eternal security i do not believe that when a person gets saved they got to hold on to god for dear life so they don't get lost it's god holding on to you you were given an inheritance right now is being kept in heaven for you you need to act like that that's where i'm headed and so every single day, I need to orient myself. I do not belong to this world. I am heading toward a world that is much different. And we're going to talk about some practical ways. The next point I like to make. As a resident alien, as my visit is of a temporary nature, I do not complicate my life with excessive involvement in this present world. Now that I'm doing funeral work, I'm reminded every single day that this world is temporary. Every time I go to a house to pick up someone who's died, I'm reminded that life came to an end. Thursday night, I was working a visitation in Pine City. So a loved one had died. We we're going to do his funeral on Friday. As the, funeral, the visitation was coming to an end at 8 o'clock, I got a call that somebody had just died. And so I called the funeral director, and so when I got done with the visitation, locked the building up, we headed out to a farm outside of Pine City, and we picked up a man who had just died. I'm reminded, and that's actually not a morbid thing, that's actually a good reminder every single day, I now deal with death. And I realize that someday they're going to gather for my funeral, and I wonder what will be said. And so the point I like to make is that However long you and I live, it is temporary here. And therefore, we should not overly complicate our lives with excessive involvement. Take a look at the next three verses. Using another analogy of a soldier, Paul says, No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. That has to be our orientation as well. My boss is not my ultimate boss. Now, I need to be a good worker at my job and all that, but I do those jobs because I'm trying to honor God more than anyone else. Here's one of the saddest phrases in all the Bible. For Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. You think Demas, toward the end of his life, regretted that decision? He fell in love with all the, again, there's a lot of really fun stuff in this world. And I'm not saying, I enjoy the things as well. There's a lot of things of this life. I love, uh, I love my fishing boat. I love going fishing. I love going to the orchestra. I love Dairy Queen, okay? I, I enjoy those things. But I keep those things in perspective. I can't get overly involved in this world. And then this comes out of Jesus. Remember the parable of the sower? The different types of soil? And this is referring to Christians. For as for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, 
But the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches chokes the word and it proves unfaithful, unfruitful. I can think of individuals that I led to the Lord and they had a desire to know more of the word of God, but life just got in the way. The one thing I've learned about this, no matter how busy I am, I always do the things I want to do. Always. So here's how I put it into practice. We moved to Rush City. My youngest son, Zachary, is a natural athlete. By fourth grade, it was obvious that he was the best athlete in his grade. In fourth, fifth, and sixth grade, they would always have a, they'd have a track meet toward the end of the year. I don't know if maybe more does the same thing as well. In fourth grade, Zachary won every event for the boys. It was just, it was just dominating. And so whatever sport he picked up, he was just good at it, and he was really good at basketball. In sixth grade, they started these traveling basketball teams. It's, it's everywhere now. And so anyway, in sixth grade, Zachary was the best athlete in his class. And so one of the dads, whose kid was on the team as well, he came up to me one day at a basketball game. He said, hey, Dave, he said, uh, uh, we've started a traveling basketball team. We, wanna, you know, get, we want Rusty to get better and all that, so we want to start earlier. And so we've got this team, and, and oh, we would just love to have Zachary on our team. I says, Tom, when are the tournaments? Well, weekends, you know, Saturdays and Sundays. And I said, well, that's a problem. I said, on Sundays, my children will be in church. Well, Davis, not every Sunday and all that. I said, well, Tom, it still sets the precedent. On Sunday, I want my kids to know that's God's day. I don't want ever my kids to wake up on a Sunday morning wondering, I wonder if we'll go to church or not. Again, I'm not legalistic about it, but to me, Sunday is the Lord's day. I knew I had my kids for 18 years. I wasn't going to do my best to orient them toward God. And so I says, Tom my son will not be on the team because my son will be in church on Sunday. But he's so good. I don't care. Okay? I will say this. I hate sports. I say it with a smile on my face. The thing that irritated me the most about being a full-time pastor is that when kids got older, when they got their first job, what was it? It's a weekend job. I told parents, why would you do that? You've got 18 years to make a difference in that kid's life. They can work the rest of their life. Sports. When's the last time Rush City ever produced a great athlete? I could care less that my kid is a great athlete. I want him to be a godly man. And now that he's married and a dad, I'm glad I made that decision. I can't remember the last time I saw him bounce the basketball. But his kids are in church this morning because he's in church as well. And so the point is, as my kids are growing up, I had to remind my kids, we're not going to get overly involved in this world. We made a decision as a family. We'll let you do sports, but we're going to limit. You're not going to do sports year-round. Why? Because my, Sunday, or my evening meal was sacred to me. I wanted my kids around my table. That's when we talked. And so my daughter went out for volleyball. Okay, you can do volleyball, but you're not doing another sport the rest of the, you know. Why? Because family time is sacred. It wasn't just church. It's what we talked about as a family as well. And so my kids knew, you make your choices. You pick the one that you really want because we're not doing them all. I will not give up my family time because why? You're going to be 18 and out of my door before I know it. I can't stop that. And I'm going to do my best while you're here to invest in your life. And so my point is, I need to remind myself, my time in this world, it's limited. It is temporary. I try not to get overly involved in this world. Another point I like to make, number th- letter C. I maintain the standards of my homeland, and I do not allow my present environment to determine my behavior. As a Christian, you've got to live a contrary life. You don't have to be a jerk about it. But you've got to let them know, I have different standards. I'm not going to talk that way. I'm not going to engage in business that way. I'm going to make sure... If God's my boss, I'm going to make decisions for that. Take a look at some verses. This is a great statement about Daniel. Daniel got taken in captivity to Babylon. They tried to change his orientation. Not sexually, but everything else. Remember, they changed his name from Daniel to Belteshazzar? Okay? They taught him their language, and they even tried to do it with food. They knew as a Jew that he had certain standards. And so the Bible says Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food. It was a lot better... 
But Daniel says, no, or with the wine they had drank. Therefore, he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. Daniel says, okay, I may be in Babylon. They may have changed my name, and I'm speaking a different language, but I am a Jew. I am one of God's people. I will not allow them to change my orientation. The same thing is true about you and I. We all got to go to work tomorrow. Have you ever been pressured at work to be unethical because the job asked you to? I remember when I was going to seminary, I cleaned cars for a living. My two bosses were highly unethical. They would lie to customers all the time, and they wanted us to participate. No, I will not lie about that. Don't ask me to do it, because I will not lie. We have to make those choices. Look at another passage. This is a great passage as well, because it fits our analogy. Peter says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners. And that's the idea. We're just a sojourner here. We're not putting up permanent roots here. You are sojourners and you are exiles, so you need to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. The world is antagonist to our faith, but if we live consistently, they realize they got nothing to complain about. Here's how we tried to do this. My daughter, she chose volleyball. And she was not necessarily a natural athlete, but she worked hard at it. And so she's a junior in high school, and she goes out. And the very first week of practice, she comes home one day, and she is livid. She is just angry because after a couple of days of practice, she got put on JV while a bunch of the girls and juniors, and juniors got to go to varsity. She was just furious. She's all about fairness and all that. And I tell people, the sooner you find out life's not fair, the more adjusted you're going to be. So anyway, she came home, and she was just spitting angry. In her mind, it's not that she was any better, but she thought, how can you tell after two days of practice, say, okay, you're JV, and the same girls, you're varsity. And so anyway, I let her vent because she needs to vent. And so Elizabeth I says, after dinner, we're just going to have a little chat. So she stomped upstairs and went out. So we had our evening meal. And so uh, it's my habit. Uh, uh, I always clear the table. Good practice for all you guys, right? I do all the dishes in our house. All of them. Okay. Okay. Now, I, now I'm meddling. Oh, I'm sorry. I, put, I just got Maury mad at me. So we'll drop that. We'll... Jeff, you can cut that out of the, of the, okay, good. That won't be on YouTube, so. Anyway, um, after the meal, Lisbeth kind of came around and all that, and I said, well, you ready to talk? Yeah, but I know what you're going to say. See, I didn't want to be that typical parent whose coach was unfair to their kid. I said, Lisbeth, I don't care whether it was fair or not that the coach did that. I'll never talk to him about that. What I want to know is how are you going to react to this? See, you're a Christian, and I'm going to expect you to react in a Christian way. It may not have been fair, but how you react to it is going to tell me a lot about your character. See, Elizabeth, after high school, you're probably never going to play volleyball competitively again, but you're going to be a Christian the rest of your life. Yeah, I know. And something really neat happened. She went to the JV with a great attitude. And the nice thing was, because she was a junior, she played every match. You know what happened to the juniors in varsity? They didn't play at all that year. And so she got to play every match. So when she was a senior, she started. But the most wonderful thing I ever heard, there's a family in town, they've got a bunch of girls, and there was a young girl, she was a freshman, and she got put on JV. When the year was over, her mother came up to me and said, I want to let you know, your daughter was so nice to my daughter that she got put on JV, she was uncertain, and your daughter just took her under her wing and was so nice to encourage her. That gave me more joy than knowing that my daughter was a great athlete. And so what you have to remind yourself when you're raising kids, don't let the world's standards be yours. You have to live an alternative life, and you're going to be some pushback. But you've got to make that choice. Why? Because we do not belong to this world. Another point I like to make. Rather than investing in a temporal, temporary venture, I need to invest my time and energies and money in the future with a guaranteed profit. 
Take a look at some of these verses. Jesus says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures on, in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. This is a great object lesson for me. Every time I prepare for a funeral, I'm reminded that person came into this world naked and they left that world the same way. There is nothing in their coffin with them. And so Jesus reminds us, do not get overly invested in this world. As a Christian, you and I need to make greater investments in spiritual endeavors than in monetary endeavors. Take a look at Colossians chapter 3. Paul says, if then you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things in the earth. To me, one of the greatest things you could do is to invest in spiritual endeavors. I'm actually encouraging you to do something. As a church, this church supports missionaries, which is great. I would encourage you, especially if you have a family, as a family, you need to demonstrate to your children, have your own missionary. Find a missionary that as a family you can show your kids, we actually have this missionary as a personal missionary. We actually give personal money to this missionary. We communicate with this missionary. On a regular basis, we're going to pray for this missionary. Think about a powerful statement that would tell your kids that you had your own missionary. One other caveat, make sure it's a missionary that's engaged in the gospel. There's a lot of good works out there. I don't support those things. The rest of the world can do that. I'm going to send my money to people who are engaged in the advancement of the gospel. And so when I go to Ukraine, I have two young Ukrainians I personally support out of my own money. One is a young lady who works on the campus in Kiev with crew sharing the gospel. And so I personally support her. And then there's a young man in the seminary there who gave up a very lucrative job as an engineer because he got saved. I personally support him as well. And I do that because the, where I give my money, that's where I care about too. I pray for those people every single week. So I would encourage you to make an investment. In fact, remember this particular parable? See that rundown barn? The last line of that parable is, Jesus so is the one who lays up treasures for himself and is not rich toward God. God wants you and I to be rich toward him. A couple of the comments and then we'll go. Number five, or letter E, my future hope of returning home at any moment serves as a present motivation to live properly now. Look at what John wrote in his first letter. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. And here's the practical part. Everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Because we're all headed toward eternity, you need to live your life that way today, saying, okay, if I'm going to spend eternity with Jesus Christ, let me get my act together now. Then look at what Peter has to say, very similar. According to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these things, be diligent to be found in him without spot or blemish and at peace. Don't live your life and then try to, I don't know how many people who toward the end of their life want to clean things up. No, clean them up now, knowing that you're going to be meeting your maker. And the final point I like to make is that my attention and thoughts are directed not to my present temporary existence, but toward my future one. I appreciate you playing that song. And that comes out of Hebrews and refers to Abraham. It says, by faith, Abraham went to live in a land of promise as, a foreign, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs of him with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations whose designer and builder is God. This life is temporary at best. And we all say it's amazing how short it is. Isn't it amazing how quickly we say how quickly the time has gone by? And that's what God is trying to remind us. 
this is temporary. You need to live with that mindset. And so what Paul is telling the believers, your citizenship is in heaven. Your loyalty is not to this world. Your loyalty is to the world that is going to come. And so I want to encourage you as you go about this week, live with that mindset. And when you have children, create that mindset in your children. We don't do what the world does because we have different values. We have different standards. And we need to live that way as well. So I'm going to have a word of prayer, and then we will uh, have our communion time. And I want to make a connection there as well. And so let's have a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the reminder of the Apostle Paul as he wrote to the believers in Philippi, who probably took pride in the fact that they belonged in a city that was part of the Roman world. They were a colony that had been planted to extend the influence of the Caesar back in Rome. Paul reminds these believers that your citizenship is somewhere else. You don't belong to this country. You can't allow this country to... Their standards cannot be your standards. Their focus of life, their ethics cannot be your ethics. Why? Because you are headed toward a different land. We need to be reminded that we are in a temporary situation. And while we live here and we have homes and we have jobs and we have the things that we enjoy, we need to remind ourselves every single day that we do not belong to this world. And our children need to be reminded of that as well, that this world's values cannot be our values. We don't make the same investments. We invest in things that are eternal in nature. And I pray that we'll bring that out as we live out our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we come to our time of communion, I actually want to go to Paul's writings in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 as he talks about even the Lord's Supper. The fact that even the act of partaking of the Lord's Supper should be a reminder of the orientation of our lives. And so Paul kind of goes through and explains He said, For I received from the Lord, which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Then look at this next phrase. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes, a future orientation. So even today, as we partake of these elements, it should be a reminder to you that something is coming for all of us. Okay? When Jesus left this world, he told the disciples, I'm coming back for you. So Jesus could come back in our lifetime, or upon our death, we're going to meet him as well. So even the act of partaking of these two elements should be a reminder of what your orientation should be. By partaking of communion, you are telling the people around you that you are proclaiming Jesus' death until he comes, that you believe that Jesus is going to fulfill his promise. And therefore, he says, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty. Therefore, he says, let's examine ourselves. And so let's just take a few moments of quiet prayer as the instruments play and just want you to think about that. I want you to pray about your spiritual condition. Again, we talked about that as well. Because we know that we're not permanent here, we need to live in a pure way as he is pure. So let's just spend some time in prayer, doing some confession before we partake of the Lord's cup. you to peel back the opening cover and you re- remove the wafer. Again, the wafer is an object lesson of the humanity of Jesus Christ. 
that God became man. He had to become man so that he could die for us. So Jesus tells his disciples, this is my body, it's broken for you. Eat this in memory of me. As we talked several weeks ago, it was interesting that God chose the form of death for his son to be the most gruesome one. From a Jewish perspective, dying on the cross was a sign of a condemned individual. And yet, God showed the awfulness of sin by having his son die that way. So as you peel back the second layer, exposes the juice. Jesus tells us, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So again, let's pray. Lord right, Heavenly Father, even the act of taking communion should be an object lesson to us as believers that we are not long for this world. That our time here is temporary and therefore we are not to put down permanent roots. We are not to be like this world. We are not to give our allegiance to a particular country that we live in, but our allegiance belongs to the king. And therefore, we need to live lives that are contrary to our world. Again, not in an uh, untactful way, not in a rude way. But we need to let the world know that we live by different standards. That our faith impacts our morality. Our faith impacts our ethics. It impacts the way we raise our families. It impacts the way we do our jobs. It impacts the way we spend our money. It impacts even what we find for our entertainments. And so we need to be reminded constantly that our citizenship is in heaven. And therefore we need to live that way in light of that. It doesn't mean we can't enjoy this world. It doesn't mean that we can't buy things and have things. But it does mean that there needs to be a mindset about us. That we are believers first. That we are children of God. And that God has planted us here for a reason. He's trying to extend his kingdom, and therefore he wants us to act accordingly. And so I pray that as we go through this coming week, that we will have that orientation. We'll have that with our children, that we'll talk about it when we make decisions as a family. And so I just pray your blessing as we close with our final song. We pray this in Jesus' name. Let's stand and sing together 419, The Family of God. you.